I got to pee so bad. And she looked down. She's like, you are peeing. I was like, what? (laughs) No way. Hello and welcome to Sold Cloak. This is episode six. You can find us at soldcloak.net. We're coming back from our unannounced hiatus. Uh, Sorry about that. We're a little busy with dealing with other things, but we'll get to it today. Uh, Taylor, you want to open us up in a word of prayer? Yeah. Father in heaven, I thank you for each of these men here today, Lord. I pray that uh, you would give us wisdom as we discuss important topics. Lord, I pray that the things that we said would be uplifting. I pray that they would uplift those who hear them. I ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And by way of introduction, we we have our uh, friend Taylor and our friend Hunter here with us. Uh, so, I mean, they've they've been kind of like quote unquote here from the beginning, but this is the first official episode that they've uh, been on. But uh Yeah, the podcast I was on wasn't good enough to No, no, to we had this. to we had to just totally scrap that. that. that did you, did you say something about my upper lip over there? You said up lip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Wow. <laughs> Not too <Uplift>. great start. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, Daniel, do you want to read uh, the section of the Constitution? I think we're in uh, Article 1, Section 5. Yeah, the <clears throat> Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 5. And there's actually four parts to Section 5. Part 1, each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members. And a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business. But a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. 2. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. 3. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings, and from time to time publish the same, accepting such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy, and the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. 4. Neither house during the session of Congress shall without the consent of the other adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. All righty, thank you. That, uh... The section one, well, the, the paragraph one, uh, made me think of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Her and a couple others in in the house have a habit of doing quorum calls all the time because there's only ever like a handful of people in the House of Representatives, and everybody else is going and you know rubbing shoulders with their uh, what are those what are, what are the people called the lobbyists? The lobbyists yeah, the lobbyists. Yeah. So Donors. you know, whenever <clears throat> whenever important stuff comes up, they're always calling the quorum, and it annoys everybody, and everybody has to come in and actually do their job. It's it's comical. And then they do punish her as per uh, paragraph two. So, I don't know. It's just kind of funny. So, today, our topic, which is a little on the nebulous side, not the most defined, is biblical manhood in society. Uh, this is a topic that Hunter had mentioned um, a while back, and it's it's a recurring topic that, that us men have talked about just in conversations and Bible studies in the past and whatnot. I don't really particularly have an outline for it, um, but maybe talking about what is a man's role in in the church and a Christian man's role in society? Because I mean, we we live in a society where I mean, we can't even define what a man is, much less yeah. a man's role. You know, that's how do way we do, more. How complex. do we do a whiteboard on a podcast? Because we're going to have to whiteboard some of this. Do we? Just be very descriptive in the way that you speak, and you know, just do your best. That's all right. All I'm, right. I'm not going to add graphics to this. <laughs> just <laughs> I'm not to that point yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we could draw it on the whiteboard. You could take a picture of it and then. Post it like in the comments section. No. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. Not Maybe. Do that. Like, like where you do your other stuff, like where you correct us on all the you know wrong things we say. Yeah, I've I've recently been having to make a whole new page because you can only have four thousand characters in a episode's uh, description, mm-hmm. uh, and that's just not enough for <laughs> all of our all corrections. Of our... So wow. I now have to have a separate page that I link to to have all the corrections. Wow. It's, it's tremendous. We, we ought to do better research. Well, some of it's not right. really. 
I mean, some of it's just really confusing stuff, like with the whole FBI thing for the last episode, like I had to go and try to do a deep dive on where the FBI came from and who made it. Yeah, and lots like, of luck. Yeah, it took days to try and figure all that stuff out, and it's still really confusing and strange. So, on purpose. Anyways, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, kind of, I guess, as a starter, um, in our, we had a, a, a discipleship Bible study uh, yesterday, and this kind of came up um not really intentionally, but we tend to chase rabbits. And that was the the kind of awkward and, and, and troublesome verse uh, about women keeping silent in the church. And we were discussing that a little bit and everything. And then of course people have different opinions on that. But what we were what we kind of mentioned is that we're so far behind knowing how to how to put that into practice in in our churches and everything because like we are so behind in so many other ways in church. We're so deficient. And um, and we were even saying that if the women did keep silent in the church, the church would be silent because men typically don't speak up. Men typically don't lead even in the church. And this is like our, our safe spot. You know, this is the place where we all agree. We all think the same way, you know, and even there, men have a hard time being bold. And, you know, what about in society when there's people that, you know, heavily disagree with you and you know it's it's much more difficult to be bold you know how are we supposed to be bold in that regard i know there's there's um kind of different different points to go down but uh y'all have any sort of introductory thoughts yeah i think me and you talked the other day some about a little bit of this uh the end of first corinthians uh outlining what our church service, I believe, is supposed to look like in the whole uh, mm-hmm. First Corinthians, the love chapter. You know, I know you and I have talked about this at length. Um, I guess you can apply it to whatever relationship in life that you want, but that that chapter or that passage is directly talking about how church members are to interact with with one another in the church service. And how things are supposed to be done with order, uh, and then ultimately how things are supposed to be done in love. And I think that the reason that men don't speak up so much in church is because we've created an environment, American church has created an environment that's actually anti growth and it's anti men speaking up in church. And People are scared to be wrong. They want to just let the pastor be the the disciple maker for everyone Mm -hmm. and not not fulfill their spiritual gift, you know, and uh, for things to work out the way that they're supposed to, for things to um, for men to be all that they're supposed to be. We're going to have to take a hard look at Scripture and go back to Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of church service that the new testament outlined for us otherwise uh, it's going to be more the same telling men to be quiet which uh, we've talked about that before that's that's the way women learn Uh, they are um, okay with being lectured to Um, they're okay with learning in silence and then going home and having their husband sort of fill in the gaps for them and that's not the way men are supposed to learn. We're supposed to be interactive. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to be hands-on. And until we get back to that, I think we can just expect more of the same. I think we can uh, expect the church to continue to put out uh, wimpier and wimpier men spiritually and otherwise. Well, and, and it's not just a church issue. I mean, we're, we're looking at a societal issue where for years now— We have public schools with mainly women teachers teaching our young boys, and they want them to behave like little girls. And so they dope them up on drugs so that they're not active like boys are meant to be, learning with tactile, learning with doing, learning with hands-on. And they want them to just sit there and be good little boys and and do their work and just sit and listen and and not talk. And you get in trouble if you do talk. And so, you know, from an early age, they're being instructed in this in the public school system. And so it's no wonder that you don't, that you see it in other aspects of life. So it's not just 
you know, changing church, mm -hmm. it's going to have to be a societal change. Mm. Yeah. But who's going to be the, the people that push society to change, would you think? Well, society itself is not going to change. The public school system is not going to change. But I think that you will see pockets of people who realize this and begin to do homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And they pull their children out of that, allow their children to learn in a more natural fashion. And then as homeschooling parents come together, uh, it probably would benefit from them to have uh, churches that are... I was giving you space to edit that out. No, I, that's a separate line. I can edit that separately from you. Oh, wow. Okay. Technology. Yeah. Wow. Yes, it's amazing. All right. Totally. But now I can't edit it out because we've, we've messed up the flow. So messed it's just, up everything. It's so. going to have to just be stuck in there. Right. I don't Thanks. even remember what I was saying. So anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll say like one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this because yeah. I remember, like I said, I know we'd had many discussions about it, but I remember me and Taylor one day discussing about our children, you know, our children now, our future children, like the world that they're coming into and you know, for one, the way different, like, foreign societies, like, the way that they have a right to manhood. Yeah. Like, we don't have that, like, anymore. There's no way of, you right. know, some people say it's war. Some people would say, you know, making $100,000 a year, whatever it may be. But we don't have a, a, a right to man. and The right of passage. Right. Yeah. And so we were uh, just discussing, like, what is best for our children when it comes into, like, giving them a right of passage. Is it going out and hunting, shooting their first deer, you know? making them skin it on their own or whatever. I know you said you had your, your own ideas and thoughts that you wanted to do. And, uh, but yeah, just what's best mainly, I mean, what, yes, for us as men, you know, to become better, but like yeah. raising our children in this world that. Yeah. Right. And that's what I was coming back to when we got distracted earlier was that, you know, you're going to have to do it from the ground up. So pulling the children out of the system, yeah. educating them in a godly way, and then joining together with, other like-minded families mm -hmm. and doing church as a community. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's tough for parents who've been institutionalized. You know, they see what's wrong. They see that, okay, this is a sickness and I don't want to pass it on to my kids, but your default is what you've been brought up in. And so yeah, there's a, everything. there's a struggle there to, you know, I got, you know, my wife and I are both public school educated Mm -hmm. And it shows. I know. <laughs> oh, trust me, I know. I've, yeah, I was too. My wife was, you know, and, and we made the decision to go down a different route. And it's difficult. It's difficult because all of your family will look at you mm -hmm. differently because you are breaking the mold. Yep. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're desensitizing them. You know, you're you're making them going to be. You know, they're going to be weird. You know, they're right. they're not going to be able to to associate with other yeah. people. And even even now. You know, with like, I, I mean, I have people my age at work now, they'll, they'll go, you know, where are y'all looking for a house? Are y'all going to after your year, are y'all going to try to buy or whatever? And they'll say, uh, you know, you tell them about a house you looked at and they'll go, well, that, that's a great school district. And I say, yeah, we're not really worried about that. We're in a home <laughs> school. And they just go, really? You know, like, you're, and even with, I mean, like I just heard the other day that the school district here is allowing a student that thinks they're a cat mm -hmm. to go in a litter box. Yes. At oh the my. School here. Mm. Yeah. And you're crazy. You're on another planet if you think I'm going to let my kid be educated alongside that. Yeah. And be educated by adults, right? Who think are that's okay? Acknowledging that. Who are allowing yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, ki kids obviously are very imaginative and, and whatnot, but kids see adults as, as very correct. And, you know, whatever yeah. an adult says is, is true. I mean, when you're a little kid, you just believe anything an adult says, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's really going to impress yeah. upon you. But you, you know? have to have something mentally wrong in order for, as an adult, to allow. To go along with that. And the administration mm -hmm. here yeah. to allow this is, that. This is not a second grader. This is somebody who's fixing to enter adulthood yeah. and we're aiding and abetting these yeah. thoughts and. This mental illness. Yeah. But I think it goes beyond mental illness. I know we've had a lot of discussion about that, you know, this is just insane. It's mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a level of this that is spiritual. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we are seeing an unleashing 
of the demonic realm upon adults that are buying into this stuff and believing it. And it's, it's, I, th- I think it's beyond mental illness. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it has to be because nobody, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that they actually believe that that person thinks that. No, I got, like I, I don't, I don't think that they actually, it, it's a, it, it's got to be spiritual. It's, it's worship of something yeah. other than. I think, I think it's, it's hijacking the part of the mind that, that is moral and, and believes in right and wrong and stuff. And it's trying to go that route. It's not a rational thing. It's, it's, I mean, there's certain things that we do that are moral that are not immediately rational. Like if somebody is, you know, mentally handicapped, we, we treat them in a certain way and, and we do so because we know it's the right thing to do, not because it helps us or, or anything like that. But like somebody with Down syndrome. Yeah. That's, you, that is a deficiency that is recognized that they need help. Yeah. 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 And you, and you treat them with, with extra grace and extra compassion you know, and that's a moral thing because you know it's the right thing to do to to be extra kind to someone in that situation. And I think we're we're using the same part of our brain that knows that that's the right thing to do to then apply it to unrelated things like uh, affirming, uh, you know, a teenager is a cat, even though you know that they're not, and yeah. you feel yeah, like you're doing the right thing by doing that. You know? our, like our our family member, you know, my brother in law, he's autistic, and he wants, you know, every year he wants a motorcycle. They're not buying him a motorcycle, yeah, even though how much he, he things, even yeah. though how much he's like, I want a motorcycle. They're not going to buy him one because he's going to fall off. You know, he's going to severely hurt himself or even die. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. But they, we're they, we're talking about a grown person allowing another almost, you know, or a, yeah, a grown allowing another grown person that mm-hmm. has no mm-hmm. deficiency of you know Down syndrome or autism. And mm-hmm. we're we're okay with them doing stuff like that. Doesn't that mm-hmm. sound ridiculous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, it definitely is. But my point is, is like, you know, you're saying like we we ha- we hold a certain amount of grace when it comes to people, you know, with autism and Down syndrome and different, you know, uh, mental capacities. Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing. That's not a spiritual issue. You know, that's yeah. the way that they were born, and they're not seeking after some. You know, they're not trying to worship something. Um. Yeah. By being that way, no. You know, it's um. I mean, you got this person who's you know talking about idolizing. Yeah. Uh, a cat, mm-hmm. you know, and going in a litter box like. Uh, yeah, I mean, some if you really love somebody, you're going to give them the things that are good for them, and you're going to not give them things that yeah, are bad for right. them. You know, so like what you're you're saying with your brother-in-law, you know, his his parents are going to have extra grace on him and give him good things, but things that aren't going to be good for him, like a dangerous motorcycle that he's yeah. not capable of handling, they're they're just not going to let him have that because yeah. they know it's not going to do him any good. Whereas these people, they have this sort of moral inclination to, to, to validate these people, but they're also, it's not truly out of love because they're not giving them something that's good for them. They're giving them something yeah. that's only going to hurt them more, you know, and, right. and that's, you know, so it's, it's this weird kind of fake morality <clears throat> that's, that's really not a good morality. Well, that's what I'm saying, buy buy the kid like for instance brother-in-law buy buy him a little motorcycle toy you know mm-hmm. go yeah. buy the kid a cat instead yeah. of allowing them to yeah. say that they're a cat you like, like cat so much well cat. i don't know they're so far at that point i don't know if i'd buy them a cat but so bringing it back around yeah yeah <laughs> we were talking about you know Biblical the system man, is right? broken yeah. mm-hmm. and it's going to be very difficult to allow the church to be or or change the church to be what it ought to be when most of the people that are coming to the church are raised in this institutional system that um, it just does not facilitate biblical manhood. It doesn't facilitate men coming together in conference and being able to have those conversations. But the odd thing is the um, people who... (laughs) What's a good term? Uh, the people who uh, like to run things and tell us how to how we should run our lives. Mm-hmm. When they're raising their sons, their sons are not raised in public school. Their sons mm-hmm. are raised in private schools and where yeah. they have 
the opportunity to grow up in a manhood yeah. uh, manner, and they're trained to do that from an early age. So uh, they've gone to different schools. Uh, they've probably gone to different churches. Uh, I don't even want to begin to imagine <laughs> what those look like. But you know, they're they are separate, and they teach their children different things. They even teach them different histories and teach them Mm -hmm. uh it's just totally different it's a form of do as i say don't do as i do usually when someone says that's because they're giving you good advice but they themselves don't follow it but their version of it this upper echelon of society they're they're following the good advice but they're giving you the bad advice you know so good for mm -hmm. thee but not good for me (laughs) yeah yeah but i think i think uh hunter you have a you have a good point with the rite of passage because in our society we have lots of soft points of passage that we don't really know exactly what they mean. So like, you know, obviously turning turning 18, you know, is important for multiple things, but not everything. You know, that's like, it's an important age for, okay, generally you're, you're graduating high school, you know, you're, you're able to vote, you're able to, you know, get a full-time job, that sort of yeah. you know, Join thing. the military, be drafted. Yeah you, yeah, you can go, you can go carry a gun and shoot somebody, but we have to wait till you're 21 till you can buy a yeah, beer. Yeah, that's, that's like you have another soft one, yeah. 21, and like, right. that's like, oh, so are you really an adult now? Right. Now, yeah, like now even tobacco, they won't let you buy, right. purchase tobacco if no. you're under 21. And also it is a rite of passage that involves you doing nothing. Like you just turn exactly. 18. You yeah. just turn That's, twenty-one. Yeah. You know, like I'm eighteen now. Treat me like I'm it's just. I'm, I'm, I'm a kept man. breathing this long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, yeah it's, I mean, not that a rite of passage should be so hard. And I think you also mentioned something like you know people maybe use things like uh, going to the military yeah. or or making a hundred thousand dollars. Those are rites of passage that are not. They're not even feasible in a lot of ways. Sometimes you're not at war. Sometimes you don't have anybody to fight. Yeah. And, you know, being a warrior is not a reasonable rite of passage at that point. You can't just say, oh, we can't have any men until we declare war on somebody again. But uh, you do have to find something with a real chance for failure. Otherwise, it, to, it doesn't yeah. mean anything. It has to be effort. But it can't be like, oh, well, only 1% of the people are going to be able to do this. Like you need to, anybody that mm-hmm. tries should be able to. But you got to try. You, know, you got to earn it. I Googled a couple things. I don't want to say the wrong, the Vanua two or whatever. You know, the ones that they they do the bungee jumping, like they build this tower. I forget what the tribe got of, but oh, I never heard of that. Yeah. So point is like, it's in the, it's an Island, Vanatal Island or something like that. They do, they call land diving and it's, it's bungee jumping, but they build the tower themselves. They, they build the ropes themselves. And pretty much if they do it wrong, they die. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they have to do it right or they live. And so, that's but that, a pretty strict rite of passage, but yeah. there's another one. Uh, and I forget the tribe. So we'll have to look it up and put it in the whatevers <laughs> or somebody can Google it real quick. Um, that, you know, their rite of passage is to go out and slay a lion with nothing but a shield and a spear. That might be the, the, the Mayai Sai tribe over like in Sudan or something. Something along sure. those lines. Of course, that has a bit of a problem because there's fewer and fewer lions nowadays. Because of poachers. After right. you run out of lions, yeah. your rite of passage doesn't work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Then you have the Satir Maui tribe who they put their hand in a bullet ant glove i've heard of that one yeah, yeah. and that they can't, they have to do it for over 10 minutes without making a noise and if they make a noise they're not a man like i mean yeah. there's you have the the spartan helic killing and also there, there can be things of responsibility i think that's i don't know too much about it but like the jewish bar mitzvah it's not necessarily that the that the boy has to do something necessarily to become a man but now he's he has responsibilities of it like he's supposed to like in a church type situation, he's supposed to speak. He's supposed to mm-hmm. engage. He's not a, a little kid that's you know right. playing around with the rest of the kids. He's supposed to engage with the other men and have man conversations and things yeah. like that. You know, so like there's an expectation change that happens. Mm-hmm. You know, for for a Jewish boy, you know, with a bar mitzvah. So I think there's different ways you could go about it. Like we, yeah, there's the bullet ant one, which just can you can you suffer pain? You know, you know, with courage and whatnot, or with the bungee dump, jumping one, you know, can you do something daring and also be, you know, wise and careful about it and that sort of thing. But something that does require something of you and to let let you know and let society know that you you mm-hmm. are a man now. Because, yeah, we live in a, a time where I – and we, we use the term guy, I think, as a sort of 
transitional thing and someone can be a guy forever. Like Mm -hmm. you can go from being a little boy and then you can be a guy as a teenager and you can be a guy as a 20 something year old Mm -hmm. and as a 30 something year old. And even as a 40 something year old, you can still just be a guy, you know? And, um, and I think, yeah, we just, we, we don't have a good delineation to know what to expect of ourselves and what to expect of other people. You know, I think that's unhealthy. Well, and, and that's why you have 30 and 40 year old males who are not behaving as men. Yeah. And I think you you have you have different types of of issues with it. You have the you have the the wimpy, which is what we kind of are talking about to a degree, and the people that don't want to engage in society, but you also have the people that, you know, they have all that natural testosterone, they have that ability to be um, you know, assertive and angry and powerful but they have no understanding of any responsibility. Like they're just, I'm, I'm more right. powerful than the people around me. So that's convenient. I can use that, mm-hmm. you know? And, you know, <laughs> I think that's where, where the, the, the liberal concept of toxic masculinity comes from is when you have people that are, they're masculine in that way, but they have no idea what, what it's for. It's not channeled in a good way. Right. Yeah. And you it's know, not sacrificial. No. Yes. And then you have, you, it's, it's now all masculinity is condemned because you have people that don't know what to do with their masculinity. And you this, know? this, uh, the latest movement, the alpha male, uh, movement, uh, th- and there's a lot of truth that's, that's stated, uh, by a lot of these talking heads, uh, in this movement. Um, like we said, you know, a lot of them are, uh, very, uh, testosterone driven or they're all testosterone driven and they, um, they're all about, you know, bringing back uh, men being heard and getting what they want. Uh, but there's no there's no element of sacrifice to it. Yeah. Is where, that kind of connected? I'm not, I don't follow it much, but like the whole Andrew Tate stuff, right. like I've heard people talk about yeah. it. Yeah, it seems to be like it's an embracing of mm-hmm. your power as a man, but right. not even talking about your responsibility right. as a man. Yeah. You know, which, yeah. yeah, it's like two different sides of the same broken coin, you yeah. know. And how, how are we even saying that these guys are men? You know, like what, right. Like right. what makes that guy a man? You know, like what? Yeah, I and I, and I, I mean, I definitely admire those those manly qualities, the assertiveness, you know, the ability to speak your mind and disagree and disagree, being able to articulate why you disagree. But it's the we're we're talking about biblical manhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there has to be, you know. Uh, I mean, it, we have the greatest example in Christ. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he disagree and just verbally slap you <laughs> and make you look entirely stupid, and then go to the cross for you. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. um, and that's you know that is what we are to be first. You know, to our families. You know, we've got to, that's if you're looking for a, a venue to practice these things, and you're married so ethan hurry up and get married so you can practice um thanks no uh there you you have to be able to put these things in practice in your home uh, before you can you can get out and flex your spiritual muscles outside the home yeah Yeah. and you need to see it modeled right as you're coming up you need Mm -hmm. to see it you need to have it modeled Mm -hmm. for you and you need to be given opportunities to begin practicing that in the home. Yeah, yeah. Because there's very few people who can just read the examples in Scripture and go, "Okay, I'm gonna, you know, just apply. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna visualize what I see here." You need a a man that has come before you, who's seen it lived out in front of him, who's yeah. seen it lived out in front of him. And now we're at a, a position, you know, where there are no fathers. There are no, you know, people who, who saw it lived out before them. We're going to have to carve it out ourselves. Yeah. 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 I think you can be in a situation where there's no models left and you do have to just read the examples in the Bible and, and apply it in the best way you know how and probably mess some stuff up. Yeah. But be be a starter model for somebody else that comes after you. That yeah. they can they can see what you did and also see oh he he did misapply these things and and make improvements from that. But at least they have something to to start with. You know if you didn't, and I think that's a that's a good thing. Yeah, well, I was I was thinking about what you were uh, 
You want to you want to say like what you had in mind for your boys? I've kind of forgotten. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no big deal. Uh, I mean, I've had, you, I've you had, had a couple. Well, yeah, you, you, you changed your. You I don't changed know which your, one you're talking about. Well, you, okay. so write, write it down this time. Yeah. 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 Well, there was the one, one. with the business. Yeah. Prob- and then the yeah. other one with making them go out there. Yeah. There, there's several Harvest different them. aspects to it. Like, I want a. I want something that shows uh, their intellect. You know, like the like the Jewish concept of being able to study something, being able to articulate what you've studied and what uh, mental and emotional and spiritual position that it's put you in. How has it changed you and helped you mm-hmm. uh, form uh, your worldview? I want them to be able to articulate that. So that's one thing. Um Another thing I think would would be great would be for if I could make connections, uh, you know, if they want to go uh, out and work a job, which, you know, they're probably going to have to do. Uh, I want them to, at an early age, uh, before we talk about, you know, I'm sure all the institutions of, you know, higher education at that time, uh, uh I don't know. I have no interest in seeing my boys go to a university or or anything like that. They're going to be too busy learning stuff. (laughs) And Um, and when I was coming up, you know, public school, that was that was kind of the rite of passage. That mm -hmm. is what was expected. Mm -hmm. You know, you graduate from high school and you go and get a degree and it was kind of like mandatory. I mean, that's just what you do. Yeah. And then once you earn the degree, then you can, you know, join the rest of adulthood. But also that's, that's a, it's a pretty bad rite of passage because it's not good for society to demand that everybody has a degree that kind of like, yeah, it messes up what a degree is. And, it's totally messed mm-hmm. up. And to, to, for your, your first act as an adult to make a poor financial decision mm-hmm. is not really right. a great starting point. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, well, now I'm, you know, heavily in debt, you know, right. now I'm, I'm American now. (laughs) And nowadays, you know, I mean, I know like most of the people I work with have a bachelor's degree Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people that I work with who have a master's degree and it's like, for what, Mm -hmm. you know, how is that helping you do your job better? Especially whenever you've gotten it from, you know, a liberal uh, university and everything that they teach flies right in the face of everything that we're supposed to stand for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I don't see the value of American higher education anymore, a uh, period. Uh, I'm all for going and getting a trade, but I, I want my boys to be able to read, of course, scripture, and be able to tell me, you know, be able to expound on it. Yeah, yeah. I want them to be able to read literary works and be able to expound on it and say, what was the writer trying to convey through uh-huh. this? And then I want them to be able to go out. I want them to be able to work a job for an extended amount of time, two years, uh, for somebody who is not going to take it easy on them. And hopefully we'll see have I instilled the work ethic in them, the tenacity to keep going when things get hard, you know, this is not splitting firewood for dad anymore, but I've split enough firewood for dad that I, you know, I don't mind putting forth the effort. Uh, now this is challenging me mentally and do I have the tenacity to keep going? And whenever they're, they're done with that, whenever they've completed that, then we'll talk about me supporting them uh, in, you know, future endeavors. But you're going to have to go out and prove that you can make it in the world Mm -hmm. uh, without me standing there, you know, without being having the luxury of coming home to your parents every night and being able to talk things over and get advice from me about how to go about your next day. You know, uh-huh. you're going to have to go out there and and fend for yourself. And I think that the age 18 
is kind of arbitrary. I think that's a little early myself. I don't think that um, males are developed enough at that age to go out. You know, I've seen a lot of uh, so-called Christian young men uh, at the age of 18. They're turned loose. They're given the reins. They go off to college and people are like, what happened to my son? Mm -hmm. You know, what my, this is not who I raised and hopefully they come back. But I think, I think 18 is, is too young. I think a a male needs to be under his dad's headship into his early twenties myself. And I intend to, you know, uh, we live in a country where uh, our government says 18. So my only other option is to, and still, uh, biblical values in our, in my boys, uh, that, you know, hopefully they will trust my judgment longer than what the, the government says they have to. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it comes with building that trust at an early age and just making sure that they're aware that this is an option. You don't have to go. Unlike my generation that was raised up. And oftentimes when you turned 18, I mean, that was it. You were expected to move out or you're going to be paying rent or like one family I know, a boy turned 18. Well, they moved into a one bedroom apartment, (laughs) like even more drastic than breaking your plate. You know, Uh, there's no room for you, son. You're out of here. And, you know, just kicking them out Mm -hmm. at that young age. But, you know, obviously, if they're willing to behave willing to still stay under that authority, that headship, um, you know, it, and just making sure that they're comfortable with that rather than, okay, you've graduated, you're 18, whether you're mentally prepared or not, mm-hmm. you know, ready or not, here you go and, and, yeah. and kick them out and either send them to a vocation school, send them off to college, and then, you know, totally... Um, totally remove that that ability to speak into their lives mm-hmm. and so now they've gone into a place that is full of the devil that yeah. is now speaking into their lives and telling them that everything that you were raised up thinking all of this is wrong your parents were wrong the church was wrong the bible's wrong and here's a new world view that you need to embrace and i think maybe we we tend to look at rites of passage as a a weight and a stress on the sons. You know, like this is like, you know, hope, hopefully you can make it. But I think we don't really realize the weight and stress on the fathers because mm-hmm. it's your job to be preparing them for the rite of passage. You can't just be like, you know, letting them, you know, have have the. Just, you can't just be ignoring them and then one day say, "All right, kid, you have to be an adult now." Like mm-hmm. and he's he's going right. to fail. Like yeah. you know, or with, with like the 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 bungee jumping tribe or something like that. Like the father should be teaching the son how to do that sort of thing while he's much younger. You mm-hmm. know, preparing him for that. You can't just be like, oh, you that, know, kid's never done anything and now he's got to build a tower and bungee jump and he might well, die. And, like, no, you prepare that kid. You know, like yeah. the stress and weight is on you until that moment and then it transfers to him. You know, right? You've built several towers with him, and <laughs> yeah. they and they do. That's what they they actually the just for the context of it, they mm-hmm. actually like. At, at a young age, they, they start, you know, at a very small tower, you know, go down. And as, as they get older, it progresses. But yeah. they, once they hit that certain age, that's whenever they, they hit the highest point. Uh, I think it, they said it's like 100 f- feet. And, but, yeah, they yeah. in the beginning, their goal is learning. Yeah. I don't understand the, the, the concept and the point of the bungee. I mean, you're going to die if you hit the ground, which is, I think, the point at the end. But I don't know what makes that the right of – passage for them. It's creative. I don't know. <laughs> but, but I do want to, I want to hit on the, the college thing real quick. The, um, cause for one, I grew up like, like with the mindset, like because of how I was raised of, you know, you need to go to college. You need to do this. You need to do, you know, like you need to go, you don't need to get married yet. You need to get you a good job, get you a good house, you know, go get a degree, you know, make sure you make enough money to do this and that. But I do want to bring up for instance, you know how me and you were talking about like the judgment seat of Christ and the 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 judgment of death on the great white throne. And uh, I was speaking with this with he had a master's in divinity, and this guy didn't even know like anything about the judgment seat of Christ. Anything mm-hmm. about you know he was like 
he thought like there was mm-hmm. we were going through two different judgments. He, point point is like you're talking about a guy who is supposed to have all this knowledge of theological views in the Bible because of this master's degree he got, but he had no idea mm-hmm. about anything. Right. You know, and it's like what what good does it do you? Mm-hmm. You know, it gives you. I feel like it, it gives you credibility uh, among other people who don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, lots of times nowadays, I think a degree is letting letting an employer know or other people know that you are at least diligent to stick with something, which mm-hmm. means a lot less than what it used to mean. It used to mean yeah. you you are you know a, you're professional in this in this yeah. specialized field. You you should yeah. be capable of handling anything this field has to to throw your way. Like it used to have it can't yeah. carry meaning now. It's just like well, at least you're not a quitter. Yeah, it's like just, pretty much you, is what it means. You were yeah. able to. Yeah. Go through a run out the clock situation. I'm not saying don't go. Like I mean, I, I, I there is probably some good when it comes to you know yeah and le- there, learning new things. But my my point is like it shouldn't be a rite of passage. This is something that you know I've learned through discipleship. Yeah, from, if that's something you want to do, and I mean like you know I know you're picking at, at but I mean he's a mature man when he gets his yeah. masters. Dan, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> but there's, a, I think there's a difference in doing it at the point you did it, right? Rather than this 18 year old getting exposed to all these alternative views of scripture mm-hmm. than a 40 or 45 year old man who's established and you know, he's got his worldview, he's got a good. I'm not saying that we ever arrive, but a good grip on scripture where he's not going to be swayed Mm -hmm. by what these liberal professors Mm -hmm. have to say. And yeah, yeah, I I think you write a passage should be something that is it's obtainable for for someone that puts forth effort and it shouldn't mess you up for the rest of your life if you succeed. Like, I mean, with the with the whole tower thing, like, hey, they, they, they they they. you know, survived the bungee jump. Well, good for them. Now they can just go and mm-hmm. live their life. Exactly. You know, but I feel like sometimes our rite of passage is like, hey, you 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 made a past your rite of passage. Wonderful. Now you have all these like mental, emotional, confusing scars. You don't even know what you believe anymore. And like, good luck with the rest of your life. It's like the rite of passage should not damage you. You know what I mean? Like right. If you succeed, it shouldn't be. It should make you better. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. I, I think using. Mm. Using higher education, it breaks what higher education was designed to be for. It's supposed to be a specialized thing for mm-hmm. someone that's being a specialist, you know, that requires that. It, it's not just supposed to be for but any it, and everybody. It's you not know? the say all be all, you know, like it's not, hey, I have this because I went and did this. I have this knowledge that mm-hmm. you don't have. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I know what I'm doing. That, that's not the case. Like I, I, I agree that, yes, I was messing with Dan over there, but, you know, I, there it. I'm at a point where I don't, I think I would like to do it just to, just to see if I can expand more knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, for, uh, and be able to, to maybe learn more how to study better when it comes to the Bible. But I would have not liked to do it whenever I was 18 because I feel, I, I personally feel like it would have been unbeneficial for me, you know, because I wasn't discipled. I, I Or even detrimental, not just not beneficial, yeah. but detrimental. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we're seeing a lot of. You need to be louder. I keep turning you down because you keep yelling. I'm sorry. I can always... It's messing me. Am I really? Is, am I that loud? And he keeps, keep hitting he keeps the, table. the table. Okay. My bad. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk. I'll, Touching the microphone while I'll you're be, talking. I get passionate. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what do y'all think about multiple rites of passage? Because if you have like a, a big and major one, like when the, when the person's in their, in their upper teens, lower 20s, do you think that there's any benefit to having smaller ones? Like, for instance, the Jewish bar mitzvah, I believe, is at 14 years old. And at 14, you're not a kid and you're supposed to be able to have intelligent adult conversations and things like that about important topics. Do you think that there should be like multiple set ones? Not the way we have it now. We have multiple ones, but they none of them mean anything. And they're all right. confusing as to what it's supposed to mean. Okay, you're 18 or you're 16 or you're you're 21 or you're 26 and congratulations, you can rent a car. Like, you know, what do these things mean? Should there be like, okay, at this age, you should now be expected to have adult conversation. At this there. age, you should be able to, you know, be tenacious and stick with something that's uncomfortable or painful, you know, things like that. I think that's the difference. What you just said right there, that it's not 
I've hit this mark and now I'm arrived. It's I've hit this mark and now these things are expected of me. Yeah. Not like a, like a slower. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a performance based. I mean, because the, the child may hit 13, 14 or 15 and still not be able to carry on an adult conversation. Doesn't mean they've arrived. Mm-hmm. The arrival is when they're able to sit at the table and have an adult conversation. But that means that the adults are going to have to allow them that. And yeah. we live in a society where, you know, a lot of times the men just ignore the children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're treated like a kid, you're going to act mm-hmm. like a kid. Like, but if somebody actually is listening to you and expecting you to give an intelligent answer, mm-hmm. like you feel that responsibility to, to focus and think about it and, and try to give it. An, and you may not, yeah. you may give a, an, an answer that you think maybe is intelligent, but it's really not. And maybe they'll give you some, some gentle criticisms. Right. That's but, where, you know, that's where the First growth Corinthians comes in. comes in, where those situations like in our uh, church service and what our church service environment should be, whenever that young man exercises, you know, he's trying to, to, do what you're encouraging him to do. I think it was, what was the German guy, Nietzsche? Was that how you say his last name? Nietzsche? Yeah, I think so. He said, uh, if you want to crush somebody, you don't punish them for doing the wrong thing. There's actually relief in being punished for have done the wrong thing. You punish them for doing the right thing. Yeah, that'll destroy you. Right. You'll just quit. And so whenever he speaks up and he begins to, to voice his thoughts on something, um, you need to encourage that and allow him to finish what he's trying to say. And it may take a minute because he's not good at this. He's mm-hmm. trying to gather his thoughts, let him come on out with that and appreciate that he's done that. And if he's wrong, then gently yeah. provide uh, an alternative to what he's thinking. Don't make him look stupid in front of yeah. all these men. There's an art to changing the way someone thinks without making them feel stupid for the position they held initially. Yeah. And you have to nurture that or you're going to snuff out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but it wasn't nurtured in my generation. And I don't know that it was nurtured in my father's generation. Not in mine. And so we've got generations mm-hmm. of things to overcome. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's, it is weird. Uh, this isn't scientific or anything. I haven't, I haven't like taken any like, polls, but in my personal experience, it seems that it's, it's easier to find a woman that is willing to speak publicly than to find a man that's willing to speak publicly, you know, and generally people don't want to, it's kind of an uncomfortable thing, especially if you haven't done it before, you know, to get in front of people. And even if it's, if it's a small thing, um, maybe pray, pray for a group or something like that, or, you know, any sort of, anything like that men typically right now i don't think we're trained at all like we don't we don't prepare people i remember when i was um probably a middle teenager we were visiting a church and um and you know i've, I've always been like a shy you know kid growing up i didn't, I didn't want to you know talk in front of people and that sort of thing and uh so but we were, we were visiting this church we'd only visited like two weeks or something like that and uh the the guy that was doing phil pulpit he had asked me like before the service, "Hey, do you mind getting up and, and reading the little the little um, scripture that we're you know we always have a little scripture reading before we get up and do the sermon?" And I was like, "I mean, I I didn't like my initial thought was I don't want to, but like he's asking me to do this thing, and he's kind of you know he's, he's expecting a response, and I'm like, I don't I don't want to say no, but I really don't want to. It's scary and uncomfortable, and I've never done that, and I don't want to look like an idiot in front of everybody, you know. But I decided I I guess I will. I'm not going to you know turn him down. So you know I I you know sit up in the, in the, in the, on the stage, you know, while the music was going and everything and then get up and, you know, at his cue read, it was just a couple of verses. It wasn't much. And then get down and go sit with my family. And it was like really scary and stuff. But I really, you know, looking back, I really appreciate that. He didn't, he could have easily just done the scripture reading himself. There's no reason he had to do that. And it made me uncomfortable and I didn't want to do it. But given that opportunity, Everything past that point was now easier. It was mm-hmm. easier to get up on on stage and give an announcement or do something like that or speak to a group, you know. And I think that people generally aren't given an opportunity like that at a good age, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, at fourteen or fifteen years old or whatever, you can you can handle this. You know, yes. you don't need to ask a seven year old to get up there, right. you know. But a fourteen year old, there's no reason he can't get up there, read a couple verses, 
into the microphone and get down, you know, yeah. as maybe makes them scared and uncomfortable, but it's a, it's a good thing. I, I think our society just doesn't look for opportunities like that. Yeah. You know? So I'm not the, I'm not a fan of the making the rite of passage one event and now you just go on with your life. It's yeah. like you've reached this point. Now these things are going to be expected of you. And it's not something that you earned. It's mm-hmm. something that you have to live up to now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking of the, I was shaking my head no to the, like you were talking about the bar mix for stuff and all that. Mm-hmm. They came out, Adam Sandler made a movie about, why? I'm just laughing. The name, oh. Just Adam Sandler made yeah. a movie. No, this can't, this he, can't end well. He's Jewish, and so <laughs> he made this movie. And it's one of his daughters. It's, it's, I mean, in the movie, it's his daughter, but in real life, it's his daughter as well. And he's the dad, and she's having a. It's called "You're Not Invited to My Bar Mitzvah," and she's. I mean, it's you're talking about a rite of passage for a woman. You know, the supposed of what that's supposed to be, right? Wouldn't that be a bat mitzvah? A, it, I think it's bot mitzvah. Well, yeah. That's what I was, That'd be the correct pronunciation. But, You're right. But so, shut up. Um, but so, my point is how childish she acted the entire time. The, and like all these girls that are the same age as her, like, and I'm sitting there like, this is supposed to be a woman. Like, that's, that's yeah. the term now. Like, she's supposed to be a woman. And the way that she's acting, I mean, it goes the other way. What's the, what is it? Doesn't it go for the men as well on that? Yeah, the bar mitzvah. Yeah. They, same situation. Like these guys, like these are, they're supposed mm-hmm. to be men and women now. Yeah. And the way that they still, and like they didn't train them. They make them, they make them, I mean, we can fact check all that, but I'm not going to get into too much detail, but like literally they just read out of the, the. Yeah. I think you can, you can have a good system and then you can just totally lose the plot and the reason for it. And, you know, looking at the old Testament, it, you know, we can, we can see that the, the Jewish nation did that a number of times, you know, and they uh, were really good at that. Yeah. Not that we're not capable of that. You know, I mean, we have things like marriage ceremonies that at this point, they're just ceremonies, you know, right. We, they almost everything in a marriage ceremony mm-hmm. is like awesome and it represents a thing. And we like totally just miss oh, the yeah. plot of what all of it means and right. stuff. But, and, but if you go back into history, you know, we're, we're really down on higher education right now, but it's not higher education in and of itself that's wrong. It's how the whole thing is approached, because going back, let's say, to the 1700s, 1800s, these boys who were raised up to be men, by the time they went to college, they were men, and they did not behave themselves like the immature idea that is being foisted on on society with the frat houses and the parties and the hazing. And no, when they went to college, they they behaved as men. They were ready yeah. to take their place. And now we've got college age males who are behaving like they're still in junior high. What's kind of weird is we've placed the rite of passage at the graduation of college, not before college. College is supposed to, like you're saying, it's for adults. I mean, we 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 have primary education for children, you know, to get them oriented in the right way, get them some basic education. And then for anybody that wants to go beyond that as an adult, they you know go to college. But now, you know, that's that's a continuation of childhood. And it's only at the end of that. Do you do you leave your childhood? You Maybe. Know? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the, definitely the way that we have it is no, not good. Yeah. But I mean, to, what do you expect when there's no skin in the game right you know i mean somebody else is paying for it and it's not something i'm supposed to be accomplishing anymore it's it's an experience that i get to have and it's it's the college experience when really it's supposed to be a grind you know it's supposed to be you show up and you take care of business while you're there uh, because my dad had to work really, really hard for me to get to go here, or I'm having to work really, really hard so I can be here. But, and there, there's no mess around time. And I think part of it is because we no longer allow people to fail miserably. Right. In, in times gone by, we didn't have any safety nets. 
Mm-hmm. And so if you were kicked out of school, your life mm-hmm. that you could expect to live would be extremely hard and miserable. And people saw that. We didn't have safety nets. Mm-hmm. We didn't have welfare systems where people get housing and they get cell phones and they get all of this stuff mm-hmm. given to them and they don't have to work for it. They don't have to earn it. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's, there's no, and I, I know fear is, you know, it, it's a big concept and everything. And I know there's a godly fear and, you know, there's, there's just fears we're not supposed to have, but I feel like there, there should be some level, like at least in, in, in society, uh, a sort of healthy fear of, Hey, if, if I, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, then things aren't going to work out mm-hmm. for me, you know? Like, but if you don't, if there isn't that concern, you know, of, you know, I can do whatever and it's going to be okay. Then yeah, you're not, you're not really going to And that's where we are seriously. as a society. It doesn't matter what you do somehow, some way, there's always a safety net. You're, you're not going to just perish on the streets and mm-hmm. be homeless. Right. And some people are, yeah. but there's even safety nets for them. And a lot of times they're in the situation they are and, and they didn't take advantage of the safety net. Mm-hmm. Well, I think of, um, you know, now it's, oh, we don't, you know, we don't have any groceries, you know, how are we going to eat dinner tonight? I'll just go to the grocery store, buy some, buy some food for my family, you know? Then as a man, you had to like, oh, I got to go out there and try to harvest an animal, harvest a deer, you know, make sure that I am preparing myself and my family for the winter, you know, all that stuff. That's, it's not the same now. It's so easy just to go and, cause I fall short of it too. You know, I'm I'm like, I'll just go to the grocery store, go get some stuff out of there and that'll be that. But. Oh, I've mismanaged my money. I'll jump on my. Uh, bank app and move yeah. some from my credit yeah. card over. You know, yeah. it's just there's no there, when when you pull all the consequences right. out of things, mm-hmm. you can expect to make crappier people. Right. If I like then you know if I didn't get food, my family died. If we didn't prepare for winter, exactly. my family froze to death. Exactly. You know, now it's no, we we don't worry yeah. about that. Right. No and we have we have surpassed a, a milestone, if you want to call it a milestone. Uh, just recently, we have now gone over one trillion dollars in consumer credit card debt as a nation, mm. and that most people have ten thousand dollars or more in credit card debt. Yeah, yeah having having zero dollars is is technically kind of wealthy in a way because <laughs> you're not in debt <laughs> yeah right our my credit card set up where it can't go over five hundred dollars so <laughs> yeah and uh I was, I was gonna say something really wise and, and sage but now i can't remember it that was unfortunate because you'll come back wise, yeah. Maybe. you'll circle back <laughs> circle back sally <laughs> oh goodness oh yeah i think i think consequences are a huge deal and uh, there has to be a real chance of failure yeah. for the rite of passage to mean anything. Right. Because, and we've taken all consequences away. Yeah. And even yeah. in school, we've taken all mm-hmm. consequences away. Yeah. And now it's the teacher that gets in trouble rather than the student. I think, though, it does require a lot of uh, wisdom and balance and stuff because we you can you can have too far either way you can see people that they had to learn that severe attitude like what you're talking about hunter about like if i don't do this it's not going to be done and i'm going to suffer and those i love it are going to suffer you know you can have people that they had they had crappy parents or no parents at all they're orphans whatever and and they're you know age 13 or 14 and they're thrown out into the world and they have to go and you know that they become like a sailor or something or whatever and you know they they live a hard life against all odds and then they they pull through and they survive oftentimes those people are emotionally scarred and they're not even like you know complete and they when they have kids they have a hard time like having compassion training you know children it's like well i didn't get any training i just mm-hmm. i had to learn you know or i was going to die mm-hmm. so you got to do the same kid you know and missing that paternal instinct of teaching and and, and training so i think you got two different dangers of if you baby somebody until the last moment, well, they're going to be a baby, you know, and mm-hmm. you expect them to be a man now and they're not. And, and congratulations. But also if you just throw somebody to the wolves and there's no training and there's no help right. and there's no guidance, then their mindset, I mean, they're going to become like, you know, like, like some, 
like like mentally like an animal like like fierce yeah. and they're not going to have that that compassion or that deep understanding and both outcomes i think are bad you know yeah there has to be a balance you know you can't there has to be that real chance of failure mm -hmm. there but there also has to be all the tools to succeed yeah you should be able to make it exactly yeah and but if you apply i mean just like back to the the college uh example of now versus way back then you know when there was that those consequences were there like you know if i fail at this i'm headed back to the farm and i know that you know that's i've i've done that enough i know that's not what i want to do for the rest of my life, I want to be a lawyer or I want to be a professor or whatever. Um, if I fail at this, I'm going to be looking at the backside of a mule for the next <laughs> 50, 60 years. Right. Yeah. Unlike today, where if they fail, they just move back into mom and dad's home right. and sit in the basement and mooch off of them and play video games. If I fail, I get rewarded now. Yeah. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, I'm feeling some tension between... Uh, Dan and Hunter, right now. <laughs> well, yeah, it all started gotta, with the uh, comment about the I education. Was joking. <laughs> I think about the story of uh, Davy Crockett when she told me about which one the where the the widows. Yeah, not yours to give. Yeah, yeah, that's a great story. You want to tell it? I don't know it. I'll give an abbreviated version of it. Okay. Uh, so Davy Crockett had uh, been elected to one term or two, maybe. And he was out uh, campaigning, riding through the countryside. That's a true story. And he is... I like those other ones you tell. Exactly. <laughs> that are mostly true. Yeah. Uh, he's out campaigning in the countryside. He's riding his horse and he sees uh, a man out uh, plowing a field. And he pulls up there next to his fence and he calls the guy over and they begin to have a conversation and uh, the guy was actually, they, he and Davy Crockett hadn't met before this point, but he was ended up being a pretty prominent guy in the community, and he uh, led, led his community in a lot of different ways. And he came over and talked to him, and he said, well, I, I did vote for you uh, the first term. He said, but that's the last vote you'll ever get from me. And uh, he he said, really? Why? He said, I don't think that you understand the Constitution, which was a big slap in the face for Davy Crockett. You know, if you, you know, if you know anything about him, why he left the United States uh, and, you know, basically that he would not uh, live under uh, who was uh, Jackson's successor. Uh, him and he and Andrew Jackson had Grant? Uh, and gotten. No, oh. I think it was. Uh, Anyway, I'm not I'm not sure, but uh, Van Buren, maybe Martin Van Buren, possibly. Uh, but he um, you're right. That sounds right. He, you know, Jackson had groomed Van Buren uh, to be, you know, his predecessor and to to continue on. And Davy Crockett just he he had had enough of it. And he said, I'm I'm out of here. But anyway. So he was a strict constitutionalist. He was um, all about the, the rights of the people. But he he's talking to this guy and he says, I'll never I'll never vote for you again. He says, I don't think that you have an inkling of the our Constitution and what it stands for. And he says, well, why not? And he says, that, well, um, he says it's about that that widow that uh, her house burned down. And uh, so she was this this lady was the wife of somebody high up in the government. I think it, her husband was a naval naval officer, maybe or or maybe a congressman or something. And he I need to go back and read the story again, because it is a really, really great story. I think he was an officer and a naval officer. Yeah. OK. And so he passes away. And the wife is living there in uh, Georgetown, which is now a suburb of D.C. Back then it was kind of a little country area outside of Washington, D.C. And he says, 
you and a bunch of other congressmen, whenever her house burned down, y'all convened that night and passed legislation that gave her like $25,000, which was astronomical amount of money back then. And, you know, enough for her to rebuild and, you know, have a, you know, better place. And he said, that money is not yours to give. He said, it, you know, you took that money from people who have never and will never even meet that lady, and you gave it to um, this, this woman. And he said, whenever the government begins to involve their self in charity work, uh, whenever they begin to, that, that's not the word for it, whenever benevolence is the word that he used, Whenever the government takes benevolence into their own hands, uh, you do two things. You cheapen the value of the benevolence because the government is terrible at everything that they do. Amen. Uh And you take away the people's initiative to be benevolent toward one another because they become resentful Uh that their tax dollar has been taken and put toward something that they didn't approve of. And also, if the government's going to handle it, if you, if you can just go and file for a government, for government assistance, then what's the point of me, uh, giving you additional money? Mm-hmm. Um, especially yeah. nowadays, whenever you see, you know, people who abuse the, the system so much, uh, why? You know, and then they want to come around to the churches and they want to come go to their neighbors and get additional money. And so uh, he said, I'm just, you know, I don't think that you understand the function of the government. That money that you take in, those taxes that you take in um, are to be spent on the protection of this country and nothing more. Yeah. You know, that's the, the federal government has two jobs. And it's to protect the nation and to hold elections and allow the people to to choose their leadership. And whenever you get outside of that, you know, and to and to make laws that affirm the Constitution and strengthen the Constitution and when you get get outside of that. Uh, yeah. then you've gotten outside the but, scope of their and purpose. Even, yeah, even doing good like the benevolence, it doesn't have the same essence of benevolence because part of that, part of giving is giving of yourself, Mm -hmm. but giving of someone else doesn't have the same effect. You know, if he, if all those senators and and congressmen or whatever would have, you know, chipped in their own money to give this woman, that would have meant Mm -hmm. something more for her and for them. Right. Because he would have given his own Mm -hmm. money and that, that's, that's a blessing for him. And she would have received that gift from a friend that she knows cares about her. Right. And that would have meant something more for her. But now it means less for everybody. Yeah. You know, just... And the end of the story is exactly what you just said. So Davy Crockett wins his election again, and he he talks to the man, and he says, you're absolutely right. And he says, I would like you know your permission to tell about this you know exchange that, that we've had. And he said, uh, if you'll elect me again, he said, I promise that this will never happen again. And so not on my watch. And so sure enough, a similar situation arises in his next term and Davy Crockett takes the floor and he tells this story Mm -hmm. and he says exactly what you just said. He said, if, if we would, if we really cared about these people who are hard up right now, we would just go into our own pockets and cover it. And he said, I will give my entire next month's pay toward this cause. And he said, by the time I got done, uh, the entire, everybody on the floor was looking at their feet, you know, just ashamed that they Uh were going to take money uh, out of the reserve and give it to people who these people would never even meet. And so... How far have we fallen yeah. <laughs> now? There is no shame in Congress yeah. about, yeah. you know. Right. And we're, we're more spend. in debt than we've ever right. been before, and there's no way right. to come out of it. We, we can't even pay the interest on the debt. Yeah. 
So I probably butchered the story. Well, no, you need, I mean, need to go good. and read it. They, but, uh, he, he, he pointed out in the fact that like, for one thing, you're taking away the purpose of the yeah. church and her neighbors. Yes. Right. Like they're, they're the ones like, yeah. let her go to them and, you know, let right. them rally together and mm-hmm. help her rebuild, mm-hmm. you know, right. don't. And the churches used to be responsible for that and they could, they could, um, tell the difference between people who were deserving and people who were abusing the system. But now we're at an area where the government doesn't care if you abuse it. The government doesn't care. They just give it to you. Yeah. And so, you know, a church would regulate that a whole lot better than the government would. Churches used to be uh, with homeless benevolence, with orphans. They used to have orphan houses and all kinds of benevolent things. Uh Mm -hmm. And now churches are even forbidden from doing some of those things by the government and the government just does it with money that it steals from the citizens well that taxation is theft (laughs) yeah well that's what he said like you're like the whole point of that is that you're making people like you're allowing people to rely on the government at that Mm -hmm. point like instead of relying on themselves and their neighbors and their 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 brothers and sisters Mm and christ you know their family we're going to rely on the government. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I know. I mean, you, me and Taylor have talked a lot about like the point of like, where we should just rely on each other, like our family, you know, like that's where that's how it should mm-hmm. be. Like, it shouldn't be, I rely on the government to give me a paycheck every month or whatever it may be. Like, and if I get into a bind, my family gets hurt, sick, you know, my house burns down. Like I lean on my family and my church. Like that's, yeah. that's what I lean on. And that's what you see in scripture. You yeah. know, if like, I, I don't, um, I'm not for a, us going to a theocracy or anything like that, but I think that the Old Testament is good reading if you want to know how God would set up a government if he was going to set one up. I mean, you've got a, a blueprint in the Old Testament, and there are provisions for all of that. For any anybody who's not able-bodied, there are provisions for them to be taken care of. Uh, anybody, uh, a woman who's widowed, uh, fatherless children, all of that. There's provisions for every bit of that mm-hmm. in in the Old Testament in Scripture, and so and it's and it's all uh, it puts the responsibility on people who actually care for those people who have a vested interest in those people's lives, not bureaucrats thousands of miles away, because whenever you put that responsibility on people that the situation doesn't hit home for, then you can bet the job is going to be poorly done. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see. I mean, the, the orphanage, you know, the, the uh, foster system is exploited and abused terribly. Uh, Everything that's state run or government run is just, I mean, it, it just, it doesn't run. Mm -hmm. It's, <clears throat> well, I think we can probably wrap it up, but I think to get back to the 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 crux of the matter, you know, that what were we talking about? Manhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just get like, re- recap the crux of the matter is you know that that obviously in our society we're we're suffering from a severe lack of of men's roles. Men don't know what their roles are. They don't do them. We're, we're, we're missing that. We're missing it on multiple levels, not just the secular levels, but also in church, we're missing it in families. We're missing it. We definitely need to get, get it back. You know, so if you have someone in your life that could be a role model, like right now, try and, and utilize that. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have a role model, do your best to, to study the, the models in scripture. And if you do have a role model, still study the models in scripture and, and do your best to do it for people that will come after you because people watch you. And, um, <clears throat> and if you are someone that has the ability to involve yourself in, you know, a young boy's life, be it your son or nephew or whatever, you know, or if you're, if you're a pastor or someone in church that, that kind of can decide, you know, how to do things like, Look for opportunities to give people at least small rites of passage. You know, if you can ask somebody to pray that has never prayed publicly before and they may temporarily resent you for it because they're really uncomfortable, you know, or ask somebody to speak or ask somebody to do something, <clears throat> give somebody an opportunity to prove themselves mm-hmm. and and give them that expectation that you expect them to succeed. Like I expect you to be a man and to succeed and that can really impact people, you know, so I think I think it's just something that we really need to strive to get back to um, to to salvage any sort of society or chunk of it that we can. But right. 
I think it was a, a good discussion, uh, but you know, we've, 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 uh, hit it pretty hard. So, all right. Uh, appreciate y'all listening. Uh, this is episode six of sold cloak. You can go to soldcloak.net and get uh, all the episodes. We're also wherever you can get any podcasts. Um, we're also on YouTube as well. So, uh, peace out and, uh, thanks for listening. Bye. I need a catheter. What? I have to pee constantly. (laughs) (laughs) What? You could just go with Depends. Hunter's wife can put one in for you. (laughs) (laughs) Don't disrespect me like that. (laughs) She she can. (laughs) Have you ever had a catheter? No. They're horrible. That sounds horrible. I've. I was awake when I got one pulled out, and it was terrible. Bad. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't know I had one in. I, I. I, it was after my last just, just fell in <laughs> it was after my last jaw surgery uh i was telling my, she's like i gotta pee so bad and she looked down she's like you are peeing i was like, <laughs> I was like what like, <laughs> no way and then they pulled it out and it was goodness gracious that'll be our little intro clip yeah there have, you like, go. a little out of context there little little bit of thing to get us started well i'll, I'll yeah. just say thank you for sharing i'll i'll, I'll, I'll say <laughs> You just like listening to yourself? Yeah. Such a sexy voice. (laughs) That was weird. That's not the word that came to my mind. (laughs)